All right, today's project is to build a fun little kit, the 1802 face card put out by Lee Hart. And uh, this is on his website, which I'll put something in the uh, captions to show what that is. He has a whole series of vintage microprocessor based kits and a couple things that don't use microprocessors. He really specializes in things that can use the 1802 microprocessor in very interesting and innovative ways. And this kit is one of those. This $20 kit includes a double-sided circuit board, a bunch of LEDs in three colors, several transistors, a small switch, a couple of capacitors, and an assortment of resistors and a 1N4003 diode and of course the heart of the thing the 1802 microprocessor this is an old Harris part here from when they still made them that's one nice thing about Lee Hart's 1802 kits is they come with the processor which they're certainly obtainable but uh, it's nice to not have to go looking for them um, on eBay or wherever they're just bundled with the kit and there's a four-page manual that comes with the kit, lists the parts, assembly instructions, theory of operation, and a schematic on the back. I'll go over that more later on. First, all the resistors are installed. Well, all the resistors except for one. There's actually an error on this version of the circuit board. Um, they needed to add a uh, pull-up resistor or something. So there's one additional resistor provided, which needs to be mounted in an unconventional way. Two holes have been drilled in the board, which don't have pads on either side of the R3 designator. And that's where resistor 10 goes in. And then the uh, diode's installed. And then I put in the three capacitors. Then the green LEDs are installed. These form the eyebrows of the face. And then the yellow LEDs are put in for the eyes. And then all the red LEDs for the mouth. And then there are four 2N2222 transistors. These have a proprietary marking on them, but that's what they are and then the four transistors which I think all of them are used to drive the LEDs the uh, designer of the kit suggests that a socket be used for the 1802 microprocessor so that it can be used as sort of a 1802 chip tester and uh, while it wouldn't test maybe every aspect of the chip it's not a bad idea However, the kit does not come with a 40-pin socket, and in my junk box I did not find a 40-pin, which surprised me. So I took a 28-pin uh, socket like you might use for an EEPROM, and took another one and sawed it off and put them together, and um, it'll have to do. That uh, R10 resistor that I mentioned before that's sort of stuck in there haphazardly as an afterthought, really. It pokes through the hole and then it goes over. Uh, you can see there's eight pins there that are marked on the left and right with a Sharpie marker. Those are the uh, data bus pins on the microprocessor, all eight bits of it. And I've got it tied to um, one end of that. It doesn't really matter which one it goes to. Uh, and there's a little piece of slightly melted uh, insulation on the wire so it doesn't short out to adjacent foils. This uh, prevents something from happening which uh, probably has a slight chance of happening, but it could happen. And uh, that is that the data bus on this design is floating, and therefore it can be any random value. However, the 1802 will respond to uh, data read in as all, if it's all zeros, it'll halt and stop running. And obviously that would stop this uh, face kit from working. So um, 
tacking it on like that makes sure you never get a situation where it floats to all zeros. That one pin on the data bus is always pulled high through that resistor uh, to VCC, which is where the other end of it gets tacked on right there. I didn't think to take a video of this part, but here's a still photo of the front of the circuit board. And over on the right, underneath the pattern for the 1802 microprocessor, you can see the letters CDP1802. And these are actually tied through small foils to those same eight pins of the processor that are used for the data bus. In fact, one of them, uh, one of the data bus pins is not tied to these letters, and it was originally, I believe, grounded. Um, but that foil was cut before the kit was shipped, and that leaves uh, one of them, uh, one of the data pins not tied to these letters, and all the other data pins tied to those letters. And obviously, this would be covered up by the uh, microprocessor. You wouldn't be able to read the CDP 1802. But I think they have a purpose there in increasing the area of those pins uh, because in order to function, the uh, data bus is floating and it needs to be able to pick up the electrical fields to get the random data that it's going to read in. And I think by increasing the area by tying those pins to these uh, large letters, it increases the uh, likelihood that it's going to pick up an adequate field. Uh, maybe it wouldn't really need that, but that's just uh, a thought I had. And now the 1802 microprocessor is plugged in. The intention of this face card is that it's supposed to go inside of an Altoids tin or something equivalent, and it's uh, sized and shaped for that. You can just kind of flip the door open on the Altoids tin, and uh, I'm not sure they this little limit switch was included with the kit. I'm not sure if that just fell into the parts bag or what. It's not described in the manual, but um, assuming it's not there to automatically turn this on when you open the door of the of the tin or something like that, uh, it is intended to be powered by four AAA uh, cells and a holder that will hold four AAA cells uh, will fit behind this and the thickness of the circuit board and the holder uh, will still allow it to fit in the Altoids tin. I'm not sure if it will with the uh, 1802 in a socket. That remains to be seen. Um, but anyway, I've got it hooked up temporarily with a 6 volt power supply. So I'm going to turn it on and see what happens. Not a lot. Oh, there it's doing something. And it's better with the light off. It's just slowly cycling through various random combinations. I'm thinking D8 and D or D10 and D11 have not turned on yet. I think they should have. I get the impression they're always supposed to be on like these maybe. I'll have to check that out, see if something's wrong there. Okay. 
I'm not sure I've seen the outsides of the mouth come on either. So there might be an issue there. I'm going to investigate that. Okay, uh, investigation of the circuit here says that these center eyebrow LEDs, the two in the middle and the two in the middle, are always on. They're not controlled by the processor. So the fact that those did not turn on tells me there's something wrong. Um, I've rigged up, let's see if I can get the camera to cooperate here. I've just got my power supply set to 5 volts and a 330 ohm resistor on probes so I can go in here and uh, actually force the LEDs on. Let's see. Yeah, that one works. But this guy is DEAD. -E Nothing happens with it and it's in there correctly too. But just for yucks, I'm going to go around and plug it in the other way, see if it... Now it's powering that one, but it's not lighting this one up. So... It's toast. Yeah, these other guys are working. Now I'm going to check the LEDs out here on the mouth. That one is power uh, good. That one's good. It's kind of hard to make a good contact on some of these from the top side of the board. And that one's got it. Oh, come on. I'll have to flip that guy around and try it from this side. I don't know if anything's lit up there or not. It looks like I've got two dead LEDs on this board. This guy here and this guy here. Okay, I replaced that one green LED with a spare that was included in the kit. Uh, there were no spares for the yellow or the red. So now those are lighting up. And I'm waiting for the eyes to do something. Uh, now I'm getting the bottom two LEDs on the edges there, so those work. I did test all of the LEDs with my little impromptu tester, and they all lit up after I replaced that one LED. There was uh, just some extra plastic on one of the other LEDs, one of the red ones, that was keeping my test probe from hitting it. So if I can get the upper corners of the mouth to light up at some point, then I think they'll all be good. That's the only one I'm not seeing working. Well, it is totally random, and uh, those two LEDs that would form an upturned corner of the mouth are on the same circuit as the two LEDs that form the downturned corner of the mouth. It's just that they're opposite polarity. It's basically looking between two of the address lines on the 1802, and when they randomly go to um, opposite states, Oop, there we go, upturned corner of the mouth. It finally happened. So everything is working there. It just took its time getting there.
So with that going on merrily, here's the schematic for the uh, face card. It has an 1802 processor. There's no memory on this, although the 1802 does have 16 internal registers of 16 bits each, which can be used as a kind of memory, but it's not being used here. Uh, in place of a crystal or an external oscillator, this little circuit here is formed with a 10 meg resistor wrapped around between the clock and the crystal pins and then there's uh, this transistor which obviously forms an inverting element. Uh, one way to get an, in, uh, an oscillator of course is to take an inverting element and put an RC on it, uh, one resistor and one capacitor and with that you can get an oscillator. So that's clearly what's being done here instead of putting a whole other IC on the board uh, to form that inverter it's just using a transistor and that's going to be this transistor here. And then the one, two, three resistors surrounding it in one capacitor form the rest of the uh, the oscillator. And it's a very slow clock. It's approximately two hertz, according to this. Um, it looks like it might be a little slower, but uh, obviously every cycle of the clock does not correspond to a change of the LEDs because it has to do internal processing. A number of clock cycles per uh, machine instruction. And then there is some clever interconnection of some of the inputs and outputs on the 1802 and those feed back around. The data bus is not used at all except one of the pins is pulled high through the resistor as I mentioned earlier. The other ones are all just floating and that means they can randomly change states depending on just electromagnetic or electrostatic fields that are changing in the atmosphere. So uh, whenever it's trying to read data from memory it's reading random stuff and it doesn't know any better it thinks it's retrieving valid instructions and data from memory so it's treating them accordingly and it's trying to execute code the best it can so it's just going all over the place in memory trying to execute code and uh, the 1802 while it has a 16-bit address uh, it only uses an 8-bit address bus and it multiplexes those so it puts out the the I think the higher byte first and then latches it and then does the lower so here it's not even paying attention to the um, the upper uh, 16 bits of the address. It's just using the lower ones and whatever combination of addresses you get uh, based on the, the random execution of random code, those are connected in various combinations to drive the LEDs. And then the various resistors that are on there of different values are there uh, to get the appropriate uh, current through each LED circuit. There are different numbers of them in series, so you have to change the resistors to get the appropriate current through them and get a more or less uniform amount of uh, illumination and also not uh, pull too much current out of, or sink too much current, depending, uh, out of the address lines. So that's the essence of it there. Um, So just looking at the LEDs here um, a little closer, I've marked the address line. So you've got these two LEDs which form the raised outer eyebrows. And they're in series and then they're connected to back to back LEDs that form the lower outer corners of the eyebrows. So, and that's going to address uh, bit 6. So whether uh, if both of those address lines 0 and 6 are the same polarity or not polarity but if they're both 1's or both 0's then none of those four LEDs will turn on but if one is higher than the other for example if A0 is 1 and uh, A6 is 0 then the current will flow through these lower eyebrows outer eyebrows and if it's the other way around with uh, A6 being 1 and A0 being 0, 
then the current will flow through the upper outer eyebrows and turn those on. Uh, these two LEDs, the middle of the eyebrows are always on. They're just straight from uh, VCC through a resistor uh, to ground and the same goes for the middle eyebrows here. And then the lower eyebrows can do some different things. Um, these two are actually in series and they're between A1 and A7. I think it's A7. No, it's A2. I didn't draw very clearly. Between uh, A1 and A2. And likewise, uh, these two are in inverse series connection. So between A1 and A2 you can get off or two of them on or the other two on. And then if we go over to um, the eyes themselves, the upper ones here are both powered from VCC and they turn on according to this transistor which is turned on according to uh, current into its base which is in turn sourced by current coming out of these two LEDs, either one. It's sort of like an OR gate there. If D19 is on or if D23 is on, the current coming out of them ends up going between the base and the emitter of this transistor, uh, turning it on, and then it'll turn these guys on. So uh, there's some cleverness going on there. A3 is used for this LED, and then it goes through this one, and then also operates these guys. Um, and uh, let's see, A5 operates this one and this one, and then they also come down and do the same thing. Uh, these LEDs, let's see which ones am I looking at. The middle ones here and here come from VDD or VCC in series and then goes through these uh, you've got two transistors here and let's see the emitter of this one is tied to the base of that one and vice versa and those in turn are driven off of A3 and A5 And then going down to the nose, it's always on. It's just between VCC and it actually picks up this corner of the mouth as well. And then uh, these four in the middle of the mouth are always turned on. VCC through them to ground one way or the other. And uh, let's see. We already talked about, well maybe we didn't, but these upper corners of the mouth are the same as with the eyebrows. These two are in series. It's between A1 and A4 and then a inverse series connection between A1 and A4 for those. So that determines whether you've got an upturned or a downturned mouth. And then the bottom of the mouth um, is actually coming off the memory uh, write instruction or memory write pin and that operates it looks like it operates all of these, assuming that you're in the appropriate part of the uh, machine cycle and SCO is uh, turned on or off appropriately. So it's using the address lines and also a few of the other lines. So you can get some pretty interesting combinations with all that. Very clever circuit. And I want to elaborate a little bit on what's going on with these transistors. I already mentioned this one was uh, used to drive these LEDs depending on what these other guys were doing, kind of an OR function. What's actually happening is there these two LEDs, these two LEDs, and then the ones that are controlled by these two transistors are all off of address line 3 and address line 5 one way or another either directly or through the LED current that eventually makes its way to the base of Q3. 
Q2 here and then the bases uh, of Q3 and Q4 are driven from A3 A and A5 and then their emitters are current sunk by A3 and A5 as well. So what you end up with is a uh, sort of a decoder. Uh, A3 and A5 between them have four possible states, uh, binary patterns that they can be in. And what these transistors are essentially doing is forming a decoder that takes those two bits and derives the four possible states from them and uses those to drive the I, uh, I LEDs in four different patterns. Again, very clever. Because the data bus lines are just floating, simply handling the circuit board can change the uh, the randomness of the way it operates. So uh, handling the board, whether or not I touch foils, would make a difference. And also changing which of the eight data bus lines I chose to pull up through the resistor would also subtly change the pattern over time. Uh, but ultimately it's going to hit all the patterns and, but at the slow rate it's going it may be quite a while before those are uh, seen to operate again. So overall a rather interesting kit. Um, I don't know what you'd actually use it for other than just to sit it on your desk or something and just let it go through the patterns for the hell of it. Um, but it was fun to build and it demonstrates some interesting circuit ideas and uh, shows how the 1802, possibly unique amongst other 8-bit processors, can be used in such a way to actually make something like this happen with no supporting program or you know RAM, ROM, anything like that and just the one I see. To package the face card for display and just for storage whatever um, it was intended to go into an Altoids tin and I have this one here um, I actually think that Lee Hart sent me this one at some point probably for one of the other kits um, the way he made his, there was actually room to put in a uh, battery holder with a switch on it that would hold four AAA cells. Um, but because I put my 1802 in a socket, that raised it up too much and there isn't clearance anymore to uh, get the door closed in an Altoids tin, so I have to do it differently. Um, so what I did here is I decided to put the face card into the base of the Altoids tin and I took a little piece of aluminum angle there I could have done this with a little piece of sheet metal or anything but I had this and I cut it to size put a little bit of a lip on it and epoxied it into position there so there's just enough room under the end to uh, hold the top of the face card and the way it works is the face card is slipped in under that lip and then it drops into position but when it's up vertical it won't come out it has to be lifted out like that to release it from that bracket then I've got um, two battery holders that each hold two AAA cells and I epoxy them to the lid and to each other and uh, I have to do a little bit of trimming there because I figured that this little toggle switch I put on there to turn the power on and off and that gunk there isn't battery leakage by the way that's from an earlier failed attempt to hold the switch on with super glue that wasn't strong enough so I had to redo it with epoxy and I moved it over to the other um, battery holder this little tiny micro switch which I thought was 
an accident before actually was included with the kit so that it's possible to rig it up in some way that opening the lid of the Altoids tin will actuate the micro switch but I thought it would be more of a a pain than anything to try to mount this so I dispense with that idea I have a small I guess you'd call it a miniature uh, toggle switch that I had in my junk drawer and um, with the leads coming out of the battery holders I can solder two of them through the switch and then take the other two down to the holes on the circuit board that get the power and I left just enough room at the corners here for uh, the rolled over edges of the base of the tin to clear and with that this switch here has about a 30 second of an inch of clearance before it would hit the socket of the IC um, so not a lot of play there um, or not a lot of clearance but it will work um, and I found doing a quick test I'm still waiting for the epoxy to fully cure it's still in the kind of slightly plastic stage uh, where I don't want to put too much stress on it um, but I did do a test of closing it and this corner here does rub on that corner going around it it actually clears it but it's pretty tight so I'm going to go in there with uh, my Dremel tool or a little file or something and just take the plastic off ever so slightly there so it clears it a little easier but I think this will be a practical way and I did do a test with the uh, face card laying in there uh, that with the batteries in here it will clear it comes right on top of the transistors here there's just no extra clearance but it does close um, and uh, the only thing I still need to do is get a little piece of mylar and to make an insulator for the back of this uh, so that uh, the back of the face card won't short out to it and again this could just be a piece of paper but I have big rolls of mylar left over from when I used to do drafting on it and it might as well be used for insulators and shims and so on um, so I just trace the outside of the base of the tin onto it and the sheet metal is very thin there so if I just cut this out just inside the line it should be a perfect fit so there's that piece of mylar in there now doesn't need to be glued or anything the board will hold it in well after I let the epoxy dry and I close the uh, Altoids tin I found that the fit still was pretty rough and it looked like it might be tight enough to actually pop the glue uh, or the epoxy off of the uh, attachment between the battery holder and the lid of the of the tin and so I tried it a few more times more forcefully and so on and I could actually hear small cracking noises as little bits of the epoxy let loose from one thing or the other and so I just pulled it free and it was actually the epoxy not attaching very well to the slick plastic finish of the battery holder it was firmly adhered to the lid of the uh, Altoids tin so I uh, dremeled off all the residual epoxy made it smooth again and came up with plan B which was to locate the battery holder a little further to the left to give it a little more clearance and using some uh, just masking tape folded over on itself I did some tests and uh, found a position that did work with, uh, without any conflicts and um, you can see I moved it down here now so it's just above the uh, the 1802 and its socket and that allowed me room to mount the toggle switch up at the top and route its wires like this and um, I found a position where the toggle switch was still easily operable uh, with the fingertips and yet still wouldn't hit anything uh, and then I decided instead of trying to mess around with the epoxy on this I would use some hot melt glue uh, since it would uh, set up quicker and I could position it and still have a couple of seconds to do so it's a little ugly but uh, I've seen worse so I'm gonna power this up now and make sure it's all still working 
Okay, let's see if I can do this with one hand. So there we go. And if I operate the switch, Actually having it in the tin like that gives it a bit of a shade from direct light and makes the LEDs look better.